situation where we can get a divorce, right? We need public safety. And public safety doesn't work unless you have a relationship of trust with the local community. Every locality has to go through a collaborative process where they heal the divide and they come up with a public safety plan that keeps people safe. Uh, the rates are up. The black community, Hispanic community are paying a very high price for this. The overall economy is going to pay a price. If people don't feel safe, they're not coming back. I said April 1 is a deadline for local governments to come up with a public safety reform plan that fits their community. I'm not telling anyone what their plan should be. Whatever works for Buffalo works for Buffalo. Whatever works for Nassau works for Nassau. Whatever works for New York City works for New York City. But come up with your plan and pass it and pass it by April 1. But we have to be able to ensure public safety for people. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to see the type of uh, rebuilding that we need to do. We have an aggressive Rebuild New York program as well as an aggressive green building program. Uh, that has to be funded. Uh, in times like this, public safety, one of the top priorities, and then stimulating the private economy. Show growth, show potential, show development, show new mass transit stations, show new airports, new tunnels, new bridges, new parks, show progress. That's our rebuilding program. And show the most dramatic transformation to renewable energy. And that's our green rebuilding program. That has to be funded. Universal broadband, affordability and accessibility. You need both. Too many children were left behind when education went remote. And too many of those children were lower income, black children, Hispanic children, poor children who were left behind. Now is the time to do it. We need to provide comprehensive rent relief. We have to do it intelligently. We want to make sure there's no fraud, but people need rent relief, and small landlords need rent relief, and we have to reform our nursing home programs. For-profit nursing homes, like many for-profit service providers, to me pose an inherent conflict. For-profit prisons, the prison is operating to make money. How do you make money? You provide fewer services. You save money on meals. Uh, you save money by investing in the facility, and you increase your profit. Yeah, I'm more interested in making sure a for-profit nursing home invests in the facility and the people and the services and the care. Uh, I don't want for-profit nursing homes squeezing profit out of the nursing home and maximizing profit by minimizing the quality of care. Uh, so those are uh, top priorities for me in the budget. There is a funding gap in the budget. Um, my belief all along uh, was I said to the federal government, we need $15 billion. Uh, and I implored Washington in their funding program, our congressional delegation, senators, we need $15 billion. Uh, $15 billion would allow us to restore everything that was cut and uh, address the new needs that COVID presented. Right? It's not just about restoring the budget. You now have a rent problem, an economic development problem, et cetera. Uh, I said we needed $15 billion. The federal government rent relief to the state provided about 12.4 uh, to 12.6, depending on how you want to count it, uh, billion dollars. So there's a, on my estimate, there's about a $2.5 billion gap that is left. Uh, the legislature has a larger gap in their budgets. So there's a funding, uh, 
uh, the funding differential also that's part of the budget. But for me, having a budget that accelerates reconstruction, rebuilding, rebirth, learns from COVID, uh, public safety, because we're not bringing back New York without public safety, uh, and then legalizing cannabis, which uh, should have been done three years ago and should have been done two years ago. It's like casino gaming. It's like legalizing um, marriage equality. I believe New York is the progressive capital of the nation, not just because we say it is, but because we perform that way. Uh, and legalizing cannabis is this year's priority to be the progressive capital of the nation. We won't be the first, but our program will be the best. The goal of all of this, create a New York post-COVID that is better than any New York before. We are better for Superstorm Sandy. Uh, we are better for 9-11. We paid a terrible price, but we learned and we grew. And the same thing has to be true of COVID. We paid a terrible price on many levels, but life is about learning and growing and being the stronger for it. And we will, because we are New York tough. And that's what New York tough means. Resilience is part of it. Being smart uh, and understanding the challenge that lies ahead, to be united in that challenge, to be disciplined and focused, and not to let life knock you off track, and to do it with love in your heart. That's our plan. And that's what we will do. Let's take some questions. Thank you, Governor. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your window. We'll take a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Well, we're joined by special guests who have joined us just for the question and answer period because they're, they're busy otherwise. Uh, and uh, they're working on the budget so they didn't have time to join us this morning, but I'm glad they did make time for us during the question and answer period. We have Robert Mejica, who is the budget director. He's looking very stern faced because he's coming down to it. He only has a few days left on the budget and you can see the stress on his face. Uh, and Beth Garvey, who still smiles, even though, even through the stress and through the mask. Beth, Beth Garvey smiles because she gets, she is unfazed. Questions? Governor, your first question comes from David Evans of WABC. David, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Governor, can you hear me? Yes, sir, Dave. Hey, Governor, I wanted to ask you, you just went over a lot of material uh, for about almost an hour. And I just wanted to ask you, I know you, you've said in the last couple of times that we've talked, that you've talked with us, um, that you said you don't want to talk about the AG report, you don't want to talk to the assembly investigation, and th that, that's your prerogative, I understand that. But you've talked here for about an hour about a lot of different things, and there seems to be that it's accepted as fact from those who've asked you to resign that you can't do your job, that you can't work on the budget, that you can't respond to the COVID crisis. Um, what do you say about all that? I say it's clearly not true. Uh, because we, the reality is the exact opposite, Dave, right? Uh, we're opening new vaccination centers all over the state. Uh, we've increased capacity dr dramatically. You've seen me doing that. We're negotiating the budget uh, as we speak, and we've been doing that. Uh, we're making good progress on that. We're opening Pier 76 today. So they were just wrong, Dave. And look, it's, it's, they don't even understand the nature of the job, right? Uh, nature of being governor is there are always multiple situations to deal with. Past four years, we had to deal with Donald Trump as president. You want to talk about a distraction? That was a distraction. 
Next question, operator. Thank you, Governor. Next up is Marsha Kramer from CBS2. Marsha, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Governor, how are you doing this morning? Good, Marsha. How are you? So I have a budget question. The legislature has proposed to raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations by $7 billion. A group of the largest uh, city and state employers, 250 plus, have sent a letter to you and the legislature saying that would be counterproductive, it would slow the recovery, and it would prevent people from coming back in terms of working remotely. And they also say that because people won't be here, that that $7 billion won't uh, show up. I wonder what your feelings are about the need to raise those $7 billion worth of taxes. You have said in the past that raising revenue could actually cost you revenue. And do you think that your uh, political problems may make it more difficult for you to negotiate with the legislature and change their mind, if that's your, your in, in, um, intent, to, to um, will it stop you from getting the legislature to listen to you? Uh, you know, Marsha, first, I went through the, uh, the list of priorities. The budget always has two, two, sets, of, uh, two sets of concerns, right? Because a budget, we use the word budget, it's not really a budget. It's really an action plan. So in that action plan, there are always what they call policy items and uh, then just financial issues. Um, to me, the uh, action part of this budget, the reconstruction, the trans green transformation, the new public facilities, uh, cannabis, broadband access, showing a new New York, showing a way forward, public safety reform, because you want to talk about 250 business leaders saying they're worried about taxes, you know what their second worry is going to be? Crime. Crime. And you know it better than I, Marsha, because you're out there all day long talking to people. Uh, so that rebuilding agenda is very, very important to me. Cannabis is not just social equity, it's also revenue for the state. On the pure numbers, uh, by the numbers that I have said for months, we have about a two and a half billion dollar gap from what the federal government provided. Uh, the legislature, you're right, has a much larger gap at about seven billion dollars. Um, the budget process and the budget negotiation is always the same. It's not really uh, a political, you know, we both have the same legal options um, when it comes to a budget. Uh, the uh, Assembly and Senate has certain legal rights. I have certain legal rights. Uh, and we try to compromise uh, without having uh, a legal battle or without shutting down the state. That's the same dynamic every year, and that's what we're doing again this year. So you have both uh, policy items, if you will, that I'm very focused on, and then you have a numerical differential on the financial need. Uh, my number has been $2.5 billion. There it's $7 billion. Uh, and that, there's a differential on the numbers, and there are differentials on the matter of policy. And what we try to do is uh, compromise the entirety. Will Rob, you support you, the $7 billion, and, or will you try to convince them that it's too much? Well, I try to convince them on the, all the items that we just discussed. I try to convince them on rebuilding public safety, cannabis, green economy, nursing home reforms, two and a half billion versus seven billion, right? They try to convince me <laughs> the opposite way. And that's the budget uh, compromise. So uh, that's what's now in play. That normally is done in a room with multiple people 
for days and days and days. They literally go around the clock normally uh, in meetings. Uh, none of that can happen this year. So that's a practical complicating factor. But the basic, the essence of the uh, basic budget compromise doesn't change. Uh, they're higher on the need for revenues than I am. Uh, I am more aggressive on the uh, rebuilding, public safety, not necessarily more aggressive, but my focus is rebuilding, public safety, nursing homes, cannabis, uh, and then we try to compromise the entire package. Rob, do you have anything to add to that, or you, Beth? No, Governor, I think, I think that's right. We're, we're continuing to talk through and going through the items as you discussed, and now we're focused on the recovery items and how we identify the resources for funding those. Okay. Next question, please, operator. Thank you, Governor. Your next question comes from Andrew Donovan of News Channel 9. Andrew, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Governor, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, Andrew. Two questions pandemic related. 30 states or so have either opened vaccines to everyone of age or set a date to do so. You mentioned the importance of specific dates earlier. At what date are you considering New York open its eligibility to everyone of age? Second question, you've gotten some statewide pressure to lift the 11 p.m. curfew, but I wanna speak on behalf of Central New York where even your data shows the sustained infection rate is less than 1%. With Syracuse basketball in the Sweet 16, businesses are hoping for some extra chances to make money. Local leaders have called for a local exemption or a suspension of that curfew. Would you consider a change to the curfew for this Saturday's game? Uh, first, congratulations to Syracuse. That was a great game. Uh, Coach Beheim, uh, it, just, it just warms my heart uh, uh, to watch them play. Um, on the curfew, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Zucker. Um, on, the, on the dates on the eligibility, we, this, let's make sure people understand how this works. Um, we get an allocation from the federal government. Depending on the allocation from the federal government of vaccinations, uh, we distribute them and then we open the eligibility to the extent we have allocation. Um, we have prioritized certain groups early on, which followed the federal guidance, nursing homes, nursing home workers, essential workers, 65 plus. Uh, we're now down to 50 plus. Um, we will be changing those numbers as we get more allocation. There was supposed to be more allocation this week uh, from Johnson & Johnson. Apparently there was some production delay in the amount of Johnson & Johnson. We get these allocations on a weekly basis, Andrew. Uh, so we make the adjustments on a weekly basis. Uh, but if they continue to increase as they should the allocations, you'll see us go down to 40, 30, and it's, it's 16 and up. Uh, but you'll see that over the coming weeks, it's gauged to how much allocation we get. Uh, and then it's just a mathematical equation. Dr. Why have so many states been able to set dates specifically for everyone? Well, they are projecting forward on what the federal government will provide. You know, uh, we're sitting here not even in April. Uh, some states are saying, uh, in May, uh, this will be our eligibility. Uh, you know, May to me is a long way away, and you can, you can base that on what the federal government now tells you will be available in the beginning of May, um, or you can wait until you get closer to the beginning of May, and there's more specificity. And I just wanna make sure that 
the allocation projections that we're getting from the feds are right, frankly. Uh, I don't want to say we're going to open up to 30-year-olds in three weeks and then something happens with the allocation, like it happened this week, and then I say, whoops, uh, sorry, because a lot of this is out of our control. But you could project uh, through April, through May, and uh, come up with dates based on allocations. I'd rather get the specific allocation number and then tell the people of the state so we don't, we don't uh, have to change uh, advice and we don't create pandemonium for the scheduling session, for the scheduling operation. Dr. So Zucker? Re regarding that, we are reviewing this request and, and uh, we want the team to win, but we also want people to uh, be safe. And so we're looking at that to be sure that uh, whatever decision we make, make sure that the fans are safe. Uh, the similar quest, uh, question came up in Buffalo when we had the bills. Yes. Uh, we, we, held well, we are actively looking at it, Andrew. And I understand Rob Mejica has also uh, been looking at it, and we're looking at the data. I join you in the desire to do it. If we can do it safely, we will. Next question, operator. Thank you, Governor. Next up is Morgan Mackay of Spectrum News. Morgan, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Hello, Governor. Thank you for taking my question. Hi, Morgan. Um, first, Governor, how are the women who have come forward accusing you of sexual harassment and still in your employ being protected? And second question, you said a few weeks ago that you would be releasing what the state turned over to the Department of Justice when it comes to the nursing home data and documents. This has not happened. Can you make a commitment to do so today? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, uh, in terms of the review, uh, as I said a number of times, uh, the assembly is doing a review, the attorney general uh, is doing a review, and uh, we're cooperating with that review, and I won't have a comment on it, and any conditions they have on that review uh, are being followed. On the Department of Justice, uh, I said that uh, uh, I have, I wouldn't have any issue with turning it over. Uh, I don't know what the Department of Justice said, and I don't know what the legal issues are, uh, if there's been any update. Beth, do you have any update on that? Governor, we're continuing to review with outside counsel on that one. Okay. But Governor, they're the two women that are still in your employee that have accused you of sexual harassment. Um, how are you guys taking steps to protect them? Are you, they working from home? Um, what are you guys doing to help protect them? Um, the, there are, well, there are it, rules. Uh, Beth, you want to go ahead? Yes, please, Governor. So uh, certainly every individual who comes forward and makes a complaint is protected from retaliation. And we are taking measures to ensure that that occurs in this case as well. And any further uh, comment as to the specifics would be inappropriate at this time. Yeah, but Morgan, the best point is there are rules and conditions about how people who make complaints are handled, and we're following those. Operator, you want to take one more, please? Thank you, Governor. Next up is Paul Leota of the Staten Island Advance. Paul, your line is now open. Please unmute your microphone. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Governor. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Speaker Heasty just tweeted that uh, his COVID diagnosis won't affect budget negotiations. <clears throat> so I just want to ask uh, why you tried to connect the two. Oh, I'm sure his COVID, uh, his COVID diagnosis won't affect budget negotiations. Uh, we're going to have the same negotiations. There will be not just his diagnosis but COVID itself you can't put the same number of people in a room and have meetings uh, you know zoom only goes so far uh, and uh, part of the uh, speaker staff will now uh, by regulation Department of Health regulation they'll be quarantined uh, we want to protect this staff I want to protect my staff I want to protect Senate staff 
So I think there will be practical complications just in that you can't put people in a room and you can't meet. Uh, we're going to have the same conversations, but it's, it's practically much more difficult. That's my only point. It's not, it's not even the speaker, uh, by the way, because the speaker himself, uh, yeah, could be on a Zoom uh, or, or just do this from home. It is uh, the staff level more than anything else and not being able to have 15 meetings going on with 10 people in each uh, meeting. That complicates it. That practically compl complicates it. But COVID uh, complicated that anyway. Okay. Thank you very much.